Okay, and one thing about it, I have been doing this for many, many years, and um, but one thing that I've noticed is that um, a lot of times people are afraid to approach the the table here, even while I'm painting. And and uh, I welcome you to come up. You can stand at my elbow if you want. I am not. I am not opposed to any of that, because uh, I was the type of student that I I needed to get my nose right into it. And and when I was learning to paint, and I I I teach. Uh, from the from the memories that I have of other teachers, the good ones and the bad ones, and uh, and so I tried to take on all the habits of all the good teachers that I've had in my life, and uh, so I, I think that's really important. And so if if you're not seeing something well enough, just walk up here and look. I don't mind one bit. It doesn't bother me at all because um, I just, I love to teach and I love to paint. And um, I've been doing it ever since I was about eight years old. And um, the, um, the, the whole thing has been a, a real adventure for me. And uh, I just love it. And now, all this electronic equipment <laughs> scares me to death because I'm afraid that I'm always going to be deleting something or stopping something or showing my ignorance and not being able to do it. Whenever my wife and I drive on a trip, I always get her to navigate because I can drive. I can remember how to drive. But I can't remember how to use that phone to navigate. And um, so anyway, I started out as a watercolor painter when I was a kid. And, um, and then um, I was a member and eventually became president of uh, Southwestern Watercolor so Society, in, uh, which was headquartered in uh, Dallas. And, uh, and so I didn't. I didn't uh, paint, well, I, I painted oil in one course at LSU when I was a student there. And, and, but I got, most of the education I got at LSU was working in the Natural History Museum on campus. And I learned so much just being a student worker that I made a career out of it. And, and I retired from that career. At, I worked for three different museums, and then I, I worked for, um, I had my own studio. I worked uh, as a commercial artist, designer, and, um, and so during all that time, I was painting. I was painting in watercolor, and um, I can remember in the 60s when I first discovered acrylic, and that looked like a pretty neat medium because it had it had pros and cons. I love painting on oil. This this is my my study sketch for the painting I'm going to do in acrylic today. And um, thank you. And and this is a view that I can get by walking about one minute from my backyard and in uh, Sarasota. And so there, there are times when I, I like to paint in oil or aqua or oil, either one, because I love seeing the individual hairs, the marks that they make in the texture of the surface. I just love that. <laughs> And I like the way the color bl can blend so easily. And, and um, so the downside is it dries slow. And, and um, that's what I like about acrylic is it dries fast. And that drives some people crazy because they want to 
play with it and do all this and that with it. And, and that's why when I'm painting an acrylic, a lot of times it is slap dash, it is quick, and, and I, I rarely I do a painting, even a large one this size, I rarely spend more than a day and a half on a painting that size, even with a lot of detail in it. And uh, of course these days I'm really getting away from detail. I'm painting more the impression and the feeling that I get from something that I see. And uh, a lot of my paintings are done uh, within a 10 minute walk of my house and uh, I live near a nature preserve in Dallas and it is so picturesque. Most people, I lived in, in our neighborhood for about three years before I even knew about it because nobody talked about it. I didn't know it was there. It's in the back of a Amish neighborhood and, uh, and when I discovered it, I did so many paintings from that, and I still do paintings from that. It really inspires me. And so, I don't feel like you have to go out and, and really spend a lot of time searching for that, oh, that perfect composition and everything. To me, the compositions are there. You're the, you're the composition maker. And, and so, whenever, you see a, a scene, you should be able to recompose it to some degree to get what you want or to make it more interesting or whatever or add color that's not there. And so the, uh, the more experienced I get, and I've been painting for a long, long time, and, but I, I tend to experiment my portfolios um, will show a progression from early days when I painted uh, images of toys which I I did my my uh, graduate school thesis uh, all my paintings were based on my interests that I had as a boy and and I collect spinning tops for, for one thing and so I use those a lot in my paintings. And then I, I was a Native American fan. I would go to every museum that, that I knew that had uh, paraphernalia, uh, weaponry, uh, head bonnets, everything. I would go there and I would photograph it all. And, and so um, all that came into play. And then I didn't get into abstraction until graduate school and and I went to graduate school from 1988 graduated in 2000 I was the oldest student <laughs> in that school and uh, but I loved it I absolutely loved it I, I went to the campus three days a week and painted all day and, and it was just wonderful. And so what I'm going to do is explain a little bit about how many of you work in acrylic? How many of you um, use a Masterson palette? Well, the ones that don't use it need to know this information that I'm going to give you. Because that was the biggest breakthrough for me in, in, um, in painting acrylic when I found out about the Masterson palette. And, and I've been painting now with it for probably the last 10, 12 years. But anyway, it has a sponge in the, in the bottom. See there? And there's a rough side to it. Rough side goes down. It'll leave stains on the bottom of the, of the box. You have to uh, soak the water. There's still a little bit of water left. The palette paper, uh, you have to uh, uh, temper it, or whatever the word is. Uh, you have to make it 
so that it will work as a palette by dipping it, by soaking it in really hot water, as hot as water as you can get in your sink. And you can even microwave it. But um, soak it in water for, for 15 minutes. That takes out the chemicals and the stuff that was used to manufacture the paper. The paper is really tough. And the paper will last when I paint, uh, most of the time I paint some every day, and so that paper will last you a month, and then you you get another sheet, and and it's not that expensive, and it's a special kind of kind of uh, foam that you put in there, and it has to be wet because what happens when you squeeze out the paints. And I have, over the years, I've narrowed down. I used to go to these workshops uh, when I was painting in watercolor, and I couldn't believe the list that they would give you. I mean, 10 different greens, 10 different yellows. You know, it's nonsense to me, because all you need are the primary colors, secondary colors, and white. And that's it. You mix everything. And that's how you learn about color is playing with it and mixing it and making it do what you want it to do. And so that makes it, and, and I do a, um, a fair amount of plein air painting. And so that, oh, let me put this here where you can see what I'm doing. I always put the uh, colors in the same place on my palette across the top. This is uh, Indian yellow. This is any bright red. I'm not particular. A primary yellow. And a, um, I like teal because it's really hard to mix teal, so I, I just buy teal. Like that. And, oh, I, I love violet. And you'll see violet in, in a lot of my paintings. And a primary blue. It can be ultramarine. It can be, this is just on this tube, it's called primary. Primary blue. Like so. Sometimes I'll... I'll use uh, orange. I put the red in the wrong spot, but that'll be okay. I can always mix orange anyway. Okay. And white. I separate my white from everything else by putting a glob here and a glob here because I want to keep my white white. I don't want to contaminate it so I don't put it near the other colors. I use these little water containers. This is just cut off bottom of a plastic bottle and, and usually I'll just have a nail or something on my easel and I have about five easels in my studio and um, so I keep that there. This is the best water container because it collapses and it also whenever you're doing whenever you're changing color you can do it vigorously 
and very little of it will splash out. I was just showing off. So, um, and take care of your brushes. These two brushes right here, I can remember when I bought them. I bought them from Cheap Joe's in 1997. And I used them all through graduate school. And I still continue to use them 22 years after graduate school. And so these are flats and, and the artificial um, fiber um, bristles. And I use a rigger. And I use a real tiny brush, a liner, a short liner for assigning my paintings. And so those are the, these are the basic tools. Um, these three right here. A one inch, uh, either a half inch or three quarter inch, and a, about a number five rigger. And, and then a, a, a short, about a number two or three rigger, shorter. And, and my secret weapon. You know how common palm branches are in this state. Well, they have these shoots that come up. And if you cut them off and then let them dry and then pulverize the end of it, you, um, you get these really squirrely fibers that do funny things. And that's how I paint my portraits, especially with people that have interesting hair. And so that's what I use for the hair to finish up the hair. And so being an ex-special um, effects technician and artist, where I had to invent so many things, um, I'm always coming up with ideas for things. And so when I'm changing color in a brush, Like, for instance, I'm using this blue, and I'm working on it somewhere, and I want to get rid of it. I just wipe it like this. And then I do that, and then it's clean. And I make these, and it's a six inch wide clipboard, and I use um, this is a whole stack of Viva paper towels folded once. The kind that you can do that. This right here are two clipboards end to end, which are six inches wide, and and so um, I didn't like any uh, of the other methods of, of uh, cleaning my brush and so I, I, I thought about it and all of a sudden this idea popped into my head and so I can lay that down that whole stack down like that and then I have a piece of plastic that was a cover of a shirt box or something but I'm all, you're always throwing away plastic like this. And so slide that, cut it into it like so. Take one double sheet like this. Clip it in there. And I use one side of it like that to clean my brush and use this. And if you're efficient with everything, it, it works really well and it works really fast. And that's what I like. Okay. In the water, 
I put a, I keep a little bottle of liquid soap and I put about this much just a little squirt like that that helps my brushes stay clean and then after I'm finished painting I, I wash it thoroughly I work the soap in there and I use some of the com commercial products there's a lot of different ones and uh, but I make sure that my brushes are clean that's why they last for what's this 25 years ago I bought these cheap Joe's cheap brushes and I'm still using them okay all right so I keep keep my uh, cleaning water here and my dipping water here to wet my brush all right this right here I did an oil and I took my easel out to the um, golf course which is right behind my house and and uh, I used to paint on the golf course a lot when people weren't out there I paint early in the day or late in the day and so I'm going to use this as a guide and um, I don't know if you can see that on the uh, screen but this is so awkward for me because I can remember years ago when I when I was doing watercolor exclusively in my studio I had um, an antique table and then I made a, a thing where it was slanted for the top and that's what I painted my my full sheets with and uh, and then when I started branching out and doing other things where I, I wanted to be able to have really opaque colors as well as transparent and that's why I, I started painting in acrylic and so my panels are homemade this is um, the the best grade of of um, three sixteenths inch plywood I buy it at Home Depot and I get them to cut this is uh, sixteen by twenty and um, I, I make the major cuts there at the store and then I bring them home sand the edges and uh, and then I gesso all my panels and I have them in different sizes and um, and then I tone them I put about two or three coats of gesso and then I tone it with every time I uh, finish painting I will scrape off the excess and put it in a little bottle all the warm colors and that's all this is are the warm colors red yellow orange and Indian yellow whatever all the orange colors mixed together that becomes my toner and so if you look at my paintings you'll usually see a little bit of that color showing through which I like it's sort of my trademark and um, the, um, the other thing is that I used to hate it when I would do I was working with really realistic stuff and and I didn't like it when I would get pretty far along and I'd see all these little white marks everywhere where the gesso was showing through and I I needed to solve that problem so I toned I started toning my panels if it's a snow scene I tone it with blue and if it's um, a lot of water I'll tone it with with um, pale blue or green and and but most of my landscapes and all my other paintings my still lifes whatever I generally tone it with with um, a warm color like this all right the thing about painting is that and if you take enough classes you you tend to hear the same things over and over but 
you have to glean the most important parts of each one of those classes. And and so um, I, I've taken a lot of workshops and a lot of classes over the years. And um, in graduate school, we didn't have classes. You had to know something when you went to graduate school. And, and um, all they did was encourage and tell you things that you're not thinking about so that you can start getting your sources from other artists and other well-known artists and so forth. And so I do a lot of that to this day. And so what I'm going to do is show you the procedure that I use when I'm doing a painting. And, and one of the things, one of the important things is to be able to visualize the panel. Keep in mind where the, the center is. And so generally, when I start a painting, I will take a color that is contrasty like this, and I'll find the center. I'll look at it like this, and then I'll look at it like this, and I mark the center of the panel right there so that everything keys off of that. Instead of drawing a line, now when I'm doing a large painting, and, and the biggest one I've done is 12 feet, no, 6 feet wide and 12 feet tall. And it was a landscape of a beach and some palms um, for, uh, it was a um, commission. And um, so when I do, when I do a, a fairly large painting, generally I will use, I thought I brought it, but I don't think I did. Anyway, I will take a, uh, this is something else I use a lot. All this is, is a Venetian blind, wooden Venetian blind strip. I cut them in strips like this and I make these. And that's a hook for hooking on to the edge of the, uh, of the panel like that. And I have these in different lengths also. And so I find this, the center, and usually I use charcoal, but I, I didn't put the charcoal in there. So I'll do this very, very lightly like that and like this. And this is a water soluble dark wash pencil, but, you, but generally I'll use charcoal because charcoal just washes right off with the paint. And so this reduces the problem of drawing. Drawing is all about knowing where your boundaries are and knowing where the center is. And you work from that, those two pieces of information. And my sketchbooks are full of examples of where I did that. And so if I lay that there, part of my, pro part of my problem is solved right now of blocking this in. Because this is the center of the painting right here. Can you see that? No. no. no? Okay. Okay. And if at any time you want to look at this close, don't be bashful about coming up here because I don't mind one bit. So you're drawing what's in each quarter like this. That makes it so much easier than 
looking at the whole thing and just trying to draw it without any reference at all. And so what I'm going to do is, and I'll, and I'll do it with a brush because um, I'm going to be painting over all this anyway. And so I will start with a, um, a blue and, a, and um, let's see. By the way, soap will not hurt um, acrylic paint. I've been using it for over 30 years, and I've never had a painting to slide off of my canvas. <laughs> and so what I'm going to do is imagine what I'm seeing from the center right here. And so center center and with a real large painting what I do is I divide it again into so that I have four four lines going across in that way now when I'm doing ab an abstract painting uh, if if I'm working from something that I've already done then I, I'll I'll approach it like this. But if, if I'm doing something that's purely out of my imagination, then I don't use this method at all. And, uh, but if you're going to do representative work, whether it's loose or detailed, um, it's really important to get all the shapes in the right place. And so that's the center. I can lay this across here. That helps a little bit. And so this big dark form right here, that tree, is approximately in the center right here. And it goes down below the center here. It goes down to about to here. And so And then it goes across like this. This is my block end. And I can use purple or red or whatever. And then there's another area here that there's a lighter sky color. Like so. Blocking in that part, and then I bottom of this one goes over here and up to about to there and so the important thing is to get the major shapes first and then that's the center right there so I've got a top of a building that's over here and then there's a there's a hill that comes down and a shadow that comes down just below that like so
and some other stuff down here and so I've got the I've got the whole painting blocked in right away just by dividing things up into quadrants and seeing what happens and then there's a whole bunch of I'm gonna go to a bigger brush um, Now, I'm going to go into some lighter colors like this. And then there's some lighter trees behind there, which go more purple. And then t to, uh, well, let me see, I'll do this first. Now, generally I put in my sky holes last. Just to speed up the process, I'm going to put some um, sap green on my palette.
Then I'm going to take some white. and put in some sky color. Because I like to, to know, uh, I like to see the value of the sky early on in the painting. A lot of a lot of times my students will say, well, aren't you supposed to paint the sky first and then paint everything else on top of it? I said, no. I find that it works better if you do just the opposite. Put all the, uh, the darker, colorful forms in there and then put in the sky around it. And that way you can reform the uh, it's it's a you reform the forms, reshape it. It's a constant process that you're going through. And when you so. I'm curious to see what y'all are seeing. I'll, I'm going to walk back here and <laughs> wow, that's a grand mess. <laughs> I'm amazed. I've got 15 more minutes. Okay. 15. 15. I'm glad you're not questioning what I'm doing in my studio. <laughs> okay. I have seen my golf course go through stages where for five years nothing was going on and everything just grew up. Trees in the, in the fairways, weeds just that tall. And, and I thought it was a paradise. Everybody in the neighborhood wanted to, oh, they wanted to get rid of it and blah 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 and I was out there sketching and drawing and taking photographs because I thought it was really great and then finally <clears throat> somebody bought it and then they turned it back into a golf course you could see foxes coyotes you could see all kinds of animals and birds and stuff and it's right in Sarasota 
there's an alligator that lives on the course too. He's six feet long. And every time I walk around the course, he's in a different pond. And uh, he's fun to watch. And I've been watching him for the last 18 years, probably. Getting bigger and bigger. Okay. See, what I'm doing is y utilizing the base color of the panel as part of my painting because that way I don't have to complete everything as much as maybe uh, a lot of people would. I use my um, all my warm colors. No. To tone to tone the panel, this right. color right here. Right. I just mix when I'm finished painting. Right. I scrape up all my leftover warm colors put them in a jar and every time I do a painting I do that and that becomes my toner and I paint the toner over the gesso so that I have that base color and and uh, I utilize that in most of my paintings once in a while I'll start with no toner but uh, most of the time I do Fifteen minutes. The nerve. <laughs> mm. It must be pretty moist in here because this is uh, not drying as fast as it does in my studio.
And I never paint flat like this. I'm always uh, painting on an easel and I'm walking after every about I ne five minutes never goes by without me walking back looking at it surveying it and then walking back to see how it's done John Singer Sargent wore out his carpet in his studio doing that see I, I am just so eager to look at this from a distance everything is so clean around here yeah and that way I, I go to the farthest corner of my studio which is this is about the distance and so I'm looking at it and I'm looking at the shapes I'm looking at the values I'm looking at the colors and And if I'm not painting a mountain in the yard, mowing or trimming trees or catching lizards with my, my lasso, no questions about that one. <laughs> Have you ever caught a, a lizard and you know how they try to bite you? Just hang them on your earlobes like that and they're dangling earlobes. <laughs> My grandkids love it. Something else I use a lot is a um, painting knife. I especially like the painting knife in skies because um, at my house I get some of the most incredible sky occasionally I will when I want to go darker and I yeah I'll use some burnt umber or Van Dyke brown or even black to get those really dark shadows in the under foliage and I never lay a tube on the surface without putting the cap back on my students drive me crazy that don't follow that rule. <laughs> so
So, as you can see, it's a, it's a layering process. And one minute. So, that's... It's so much fun to, to mix whites because it takes so little color to change it. You're welcome. Okay, any questions? What? You are the only good demo we've seen for two Thank you. Days. Thank you. You're coming to your workshop. Oh, that's one thing I forgot to mention. That I'm, I've got workshops and classes. Oh, yeah, we just saw that. You just saw it? Yeah, we brought up the website. So oh, we good, there. good. So we'll be there. It's I am yeah. terrible about self-promotion. And... Uh, <laughs> we don't care about the promotion. Oh, God. Oh, that was a wonderful demo. Who's here? The, the ones you were using as a reference. Uh, somebody picked it up. You have it painted the same, same, like you showed us the original, and now you're painting this one. Do you ever get it to be exactly the same? No, no. It's always yeah. No, because I'm, I don't copy paintings. I reinterpret them. Okay. I don't know what happened to it. <coughs> That's weird. It, the plein air class is in a different location each week, but there are locations that are close to the music, to the art center. art center. So you just go to the art center and then. Yeah, and and after the first class, uh, I will uh, send. Um, that was what I need. I'll send maps. Great. I'll email maps to everybody. Beautiful. And uh, and then after. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll have the, all the maps printed, first of all, and I'll just hand them out in the class. Yeah. That's the easiest way. Yeah, we can find our way around Sarasota. Yeah, there. yeah. Well, it's been a pleasure. I really well, enjoyed that. Eileen Wright. Eileen Wright. Yeah, so thank you. I appreciate it.